रथ लप गतम घन सुंदरम Great mountain of the Garhwal Himalayas is Nanda Devi, with its twin summits both standing at 25,645 feet. The mountain stands in a vast ring of peaks, about 70 miles in circumference. In this ring, there are no less than 19 peaks over 21,000 feet, and no known break below 17,000 feet, except in the west. up the incredible gorge of the rishi ganga the first successful entry through the gorge of the rishi ganga was made in 1934 after years of failed attempts eric shipton and h w tillman entered the pages of exploration history when they along with their shape up porters became the first men to set foot in the inner sanctuary of nanda devi In the southern ring of Nanda Devi is situated the great circle of Mike Toli, Trishul and Nanda Kot all over 22000 feet. The main axis of the range continues north through Dunagiri 23184 feet on the northern sanctuary wall of Nanda Devi and on to the Chokhamba group. smack atop the headwaters of all the main source rivers of the ganga chokhamba meaning four pillars lies as a 23 and a half thousand foot mooring post for the great gangotri glacier to the west the bagirathi glacier to the north and the glacier systems of satopant and bhagat khadak to the east the magnificent 30 km long ridge has four peaks in the 7000 meter region and two unnamed points also nearly 7000 meters above sea level kamala patim all around chokhamba is a concentration of peaks to rival nanda devi satopant shivling the kedarnath massif bagirathi sisters and others to the northeast 36 kilometers beyond badrinath lies another impressive grouping almost on the indo tibetan border with mana and kemet as the principal peaks from here to the plains of uttar pradesh is essentially a descent down the flanks of the great himalaya the alaknanda being the principal architect of the topography in these regions in its downward rush the alaknanda has carved both narrow gorges and wide valleys which are believed to be the remnants of huge lakes formed when the river was periodically blocked during the various phases of himalayan uplift Badrinath is the site where Lord Vishnu meditated for thousands of years 
eating just the badri grass found here. Hence the name Badrinath. Sometime in the 11th century came the great reformer Adi Sankra and decreed it along with the other great dhans of Uttarakhand to be a meeting place between heaven and earth and consequently a site of pilgrimage. And so they came, all ages, all sizes, from every conceivable corner of India, all hoping for a glimpse of divinity. Over the centuries, as Badrinath grew in fame and repute, the number of pilgrims gradually increased. The journey was so dangerous that many didn't make it. The rigors were such that one bade a final farewell to everyone upon leaving home. The present temple was built by the Raja of Tiri in the 15th century and the town grew gradually in the intervening centuries. That is, till the mid-1960s and the coming of the motor road, Pilgrim traffic has been going up in a geometric progression ever since and this has had unfortunate results. Badrinath, which earlier had a mystique all its own, with the river gracefully curving through the ghats in the center of town, has now been totally vandalized by state and private charitable institutions building huge concrete structures all over the place. They have not even spared sites of archaeological importance like the ghats, covering everything up with the ubiquitous concrete. Rampant construction continues unabated with little regard for either aesthetics or environment. And thus on one side the old town and on the other side the new are coming to increasingly wear the same face. Pollution abounds, naturally, because of the yearly influx of lakhs of people. The pilgrims, in large majority, have a very single-minded approach centered around the temple and other sites of religious significance. The altitude and cold, along with the high volume oriented approach of the tour operators, discourage a long stay and have led to the emergence of a quick in and out system with the attendant emergence of ramshackle infrastructure devoid of any attention to aesthetic or environmental details. This has had an absolutely devastating effect on the local ecosystem. Birch forests which earlier existed in this area have all been used up as fuel wood and tourist souvenirs such as these. What price cleaning the Ganga when it is being polluted at its very source? In the urge for out with the old and in with the new, very much like Aladdin's lamp, we are replacing the magical with the mundane. Garuna Vahanam Bujilochanam Garhwal, over the centuries, because of its sacred aura, has attracted a large number of saints, sages, seers, savants, and sometimes charlatans. 
more genuine of these sages live permanently at altitudes otherwise deemed uninhabitable, especially in winters. Charan Paduka, above Badrinath, in the shadow of Mount Nilkant, is one such place. Unfortunately, some of these sages are the least eco-friendly. Their demands for fuel wood have led to the destruction of a magnificent birch forest which earlier existed at the head of this valley. The silver birch, or the Bhojpatra, as it is known in India, was the parchment on which many of our ancient texts were written. Any sage, however, thinking of doing anything in the way of literature here in future, had better bring along his own word processor. Nilkant has been called one of the most accessible peaks in the Himalayas, as well as one of the most beautiful. Yet, its accessibility is more of an appearance than fact. For Mount Nilkant has so far only been scaled twice, and that too in an area overrun by mountaineers. The height differential between the peak and Badrinath Down is 3,500 meters or about 10,500 feet in a short interval of just 9 kilometers. Also, as mountaineers have remarked, Nilkant is a mountain with very formidable defenses. Long pinnacle ridges, steep avalanche prone faces, and unpredictable local weather conditions combine to turn away even the very persistent. Amongst those who persevered, several perished on its icy slope. Upper Garhwal is inhabited by tribals of mixed Indo-Tibetan descent. One of the more important tribes are the semi-nomadic marchas of the Mana and Niti valleys. Accomplished traders, these tribals have now fallen upon hard days. All over the Himalayas, women are the most visible workers and it is no different in Garhwal. Their grind continues the same way it has for centuries. The men go to the plains or work as porters in the religious areas, coming closer to the modern world. But for the women, especially in the high altitude areas, where the only TV they know of is a disease, a distant bus is the only glimpse she has of the modern world. Mana village, just north of Badrinath, is the last hamlet on the old route to Tibet via the Mana Pass. In those days, 
Mana must have been a big and prosperous village. References being made to it in 1624 by Jesuit priests trying to reach the Tibetan kingdom of Gugi. Inhabited by people of Indo-Tibetan descent, the shrinkage in the village size is obvious by the number of abandoned houses here. The ban on trade with Tibet and the imposition of inner line restrictions may have deprived Mana of its very reason for existence in these harsh and rarefied altitudes. Nowadays, the inhabitants of Mana village rely primarily on the pilgrim trade for their very subsistence. In winter, Mana lies buried under 15 feet of snow and the inhabitants move down the Alaknanda Valley. Here at Bhimpul, we have a natural rock bridge with the waters of the not-so-infant Alaknanda boiling in the rock cauldron below. Here, near the village of Mana, the river meets with a tributary arising from a small lake near the 17,985 feet high Mana Pass on the Indo-Tibetan border. Just after the Badrinath town, the Alaknanda enters a deep gorge with near perpendicular quartzite walls, cutting a 22 kilometer long swath through the great Himalaya range to meet up with the Dholi Ganga, an equal in size and velocity as it rushes down from the glacier on 25,641 foot high Kamen, one of the real biggies of the region. Above the confluence of the Alaknanda and Dholi rivers lies Joshimat at an altitude of 6,600 feet. Earlier, one of the handsomest villages in the entire Garhwal region. The houses were made of wood and stone with roofs covered with slabs of slate. Doors, windows and balconies were decorated with splendid wood carvings. Doors on the windows depicting elephants stained dark red or green. This courtyard harkens back to an era now only experienced in 19th century travelogues. The squalor of modern day Joshimat seems far away amidst the bird song. Regal swans and elephants may seem a bit incongruous in this high Himalayan setting, but Joshimat was, for centuries, an important stage in a major trade route and open to all sorts of outside influences.
In Joshi Mat too, as all over the Himalayas, the old is fast succumbing to the new, and it isn't always a very pleasant sight. Joshimath has for centuries been an important point on the route to Badrinath and Tibet beyond through the Mana Pass. It is also the gateway to the famed Nanda Devi sanctuary and its nearby peaks. Soaring is perhaps the most spectacular form of bird flight. By various manipulations of its wings and tail, the bird takes advantage of ascending air currents or thermals as they are called. The study of birds has often proved useful, not just to ornithologists. Modern aircraft design owes a lot to the study of birds in flight especially heavy birds. Their slotted wingtips provided the inspiration behind the development of control surfaces on the wings, thus enabling heavy aircraft to land at slower speeds without stalling. The larger Himalayan Raptors provide perfect examples of this feat of evolutionary design and engineering. The pilgrim route along the Alaknanda leads through some splendid forests in which long-tailed black-faced langurs can be seen swinging in the trees. High up above the gorge, a lone Lamagaya circles, borne upwards by the strong thermal currents rising up from the heated rocks far below. The Bhagirathi and the Alaknanda valleys hold good stocks of wildlife, perhaps because it's a sacred region. The Bharal is known as the Himalayan blue sheep, though strangely enough, it is neither blue nor is it a sheep. Taxonomically, it is a cross between a sheep and a goat, though larger than either. Incredibly sure-footed, Bharal are rarely seen by most Himalayan visitors because they prefer elevations of above 14,000 feet, only coming lower in the winter. They also seem to prefer precipitous slopes, the crumblier the better. And foraging on the alpine grasses, they move in herds of up to 50 or more. Though smaller parties diverge here and there during the day. Some 300 odd species of birds are endemic to the Himalayas and their distribution varies according to a seasonal altitudinal range. Various species of woodpeckers and their cousins thrive in the western Himalayas, foraging amongst the wealth of three species available.
This tree creeper is adapted to literally running up trees in short bursts, defying gravity without a single flap of his wings. Inhabiting both broadleaved and coniferous forests, the tree creeper ranges up to 12,000 feet in summer, spending its days in probing promising crevices in the bark. A flowering tree offers a good opportunity for observing smaller avifauna like finches, babblers and tits. A gregarious bird, the long-tailed blue magpie comes in two varieties yellow and red build. Loud, both in manner and appearance, the magpie has a graceful rocketing flight with the tail feather performing a stabilizing function. Omnivorous, they are not above scavenging or stealing from nests, generally traveling in a gang of five to seven birds. Nearly 18,000 species of butterflies have been discovered worldwide and they have become a key test group for ecological and evolutionary research. They are particularly amenable to laboratory analysis of a genetic nature and are thought to be representative of most herbivorous insects, humanity's most important competitor for food. They also serve as key indicator species for environmental disruption. Butterflies are interesting for other reasons too. The way they protect themselves from predators, for example. Some have vivid designs, like eyes to draw attention away from vital body parts and onto the fringes of the wings. It's obvious why this one is called the jewel four ring. This bright one is Jezebel, probably after the biblical harlot. Some, like the common crow, have noxious body tissues due to its larvae feeding on oleander and nettles. They have vivid coloration and markings to warn off predatory birds. Most interestingly, other butterflies have developed talents of mimicry so that their coloration makes them appear to be of the noxious variety. For further safety, they hang around with the common crow and others like it. Not surprisingly, these are the most common butterflies. This moth-like fellow is the skipper, one of the fastest flying butterflies, and therein lies his defense. Butterflies also have a seasonal altitudinal range, though some roam much higher like the common tortoise shell, spotted last year at 24,000 feet by an expedition attempting Mount Nandadevi. <laughs> 